Today I want to talk about the timeline of how I helped Kylie go from nonverbal and aggressive to the chatterbox she is today. And please be patient with me because my brain does not like going back there. The story of course starts much earlier when I first started noticing that Kylie was not able to speak. But we're going to start with her fourth birthday when she was not able to blow out the candles on her birthday cake. So I was watching her, videotaping her, not able to blow out these candles and I realized if she can't physically blow out candles, how can I expect her to speak? I went straight to the academic journal database and I saw all kinds of research on the facial muscle oddities in autistics and how making these facial expressions is harder for them. That's when I started giving her the Smarty Pants vitamins and the muscle vibration therapy. So this is October of 2020. I figured these are muscles just like any other, so I took a bodybuilding approach. I wanted her to have the right building blocks there and the right exercises to help her. So we were working on blowing out candles and all that stuff, but it didn't help with her behaviors and she wasn't talking yet. I hadn't yet reached the actual full protocol that I'd used for her at that point, so it wasn't helping. Which brings us to April of 2021, where she officially gets her nonverbal autism diagnosis. Her doctors were starting to prepare me for her being permanently disabled. They put her on the Children's Long-Term Support Services Plan and Katie Beckett. And these are programs that are meant for... My brain keeps skipping. It does not like this story. Um, again, not a story of my life. This is... It causes a lot of cognitive dissonance for me. This is very painful. These programs are for kids that qualify for institutionalization so that they can stay home with their families. Learning how to sift through the academic journal database and put things together is a skill and one that took me a while to learn how to learn science as a language. So this part of the process was very slow, but I was doing what I could. I knew all about special education stuff because I'd been going to school for it. So all the inter early intervention things is what I was doing with her. But she was in ABA therapy and it was making everything worse. Her behaviors were getting so extreme because they were not taking her need for communication or her fight or flight behaviors into account into their framework of functions of behavior. So they were misattributing them. She was getting more frustrated because she wasn't being understood. And not only that, she was being gaslit and suppressed. And she was an eloper. We lived really close to the lake. So she would run to the lake to go see the ducks and she liked to swim and it became such a safety hazard that they put in a fence for us. This is September of 2021. I even went as far as making a dictionary so that they would understand her. I was a stay-at-home mom helping her through all this and I ended up going back to work while she went to ABA therapy. My marriage was falling apart. He had cheated before. I just, I couldn't figure out how to trust him again. I knew it was going to shambles. I was going to start student teaching in that spring so that I could graduate with my teaching degree and hopefully be fine. Right before I was about to start student teaching, a student gave me a concussion. Kylie had just gotten her nonverbal autism diagnosis. Her ABA therapists were telling me she might not qualify for full-time school in the fall. So I made the decision to graduate with independent majors in education, special education, and a minor in instruction strategies. My ex-husband left at the end of February in 2022. So I had a nonverbal kid, an active concussion, and I had to figure out what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I had just started creating the plan for how I was going to help Kylie. I was writing documents on the neurobiology, and I decided I was going to put everything I had into getting Kylie help between then and before school starts. Part two of the timeline of how I helped Kylie go from nonverbal and aggressive to the chatterbox that she is. To do ABA, they make you have parent training sessions. And these parent training sessions turned into me trying to teach Kylie's ABA therapist what I knew and them trying to teach me what they knew and they weren't matching. So they referred me to this book. And so I wrote the person who wrote the book and told him my theory about the fact that their frustration levels are so high because they're cognizant. And he's like, nope, there's no way to know that. Not without a functional behavior assessment, uh, but they have a fatal flaw. <laughs> The functions of behavior doesn't include autonomic fight or flight behaviors or communication even. And this is how NeuroTago was born. I went back to the academic journal database and I figured out everything I could about the neurobiology of autism and how to strengthen, build, grow connections in the brain down to the motor neurons into the facial muscles. Kylie had some functional language by the end of 2021, but she was still considered a nonverbal diagnosis. And this caused a lot of cognitive dissonance for me because I was so excited and happy that she was able to say words, even in a limited capacity. 
but I had no idea how far I was going to be able to take it once I developed neurotoggle. The professionals were starting to tell me that I need to accept my situation because this sporadic functional language would be all she would ever be able to achieve. That I should consider myself lucky, embrace myself for the behaviors, which is the hardest part of having a nonverbal child. Which is ironically why I emailed the man in the first place. Because I saw that as her language was developing, her, her frustration was going down because she was cognizant. Because her frustration was a sign of her cognizance. But everyone around me was saying, no, that's not a sign. And I'm like, I'm seeing this change happen in real life. But it's neurotago that lowered her aggression, turned her into a complete chatterbox. And extremely social. It's amazing. So all before, when I was just targeting the facial muscles in an isolated context, through neurotoggle, I started connecting everything together through multiple areas of the brain. It was sensory, in motor, in touch, in taste, in tactile, visual, auditory, everything I could use all at once while I'm trying to teach her something to make sure it's encoded and linked up through an engram ensemble and complex and lots of sciencey stuff. But it's essentially making sure that it's webbing the brain instead of just isolated. This has been a very long journey and it was not just a light switch that went off and all of a sudden she was talking. It was me learning about how to help her as I'm helping her, turning it into the neural toggle framework. By the time she started kindergarten, September of 2022, she was talking. By the time she started first grade, she was emotionally regulated. This year, when she started second grade, she could write her own name. And now she's learning how to read. She has a lot of catching up to do, but that gap is a lot easier to close starting early on. Because as kids age, that gap just widens. Because autism is a biomedical neurodevelopmental disorder. Which takes us to part three. Part three of the timeline is no longer about how I took Kylie from silence to speech. It's the story of how I shared it with the world and everything that came after. So after I released it with the world, I started getting all kinds of questions about how does her nonverbality relate to her autism? And that's when I started mapping it all out. And the one thing that I saw prevalent across the research that was the same for everything was stress hyperglycemia. That's where when your body is under cellular stress, your blood sugar goes up, which I now know why, because when the scales tip and you're under cellular stress, your body changes the way that it uses energy, which are these little battery packs. So it starts pulling at the glucose storage, and I'm like, why don't they test for this in pregnant women? Your body is constantly under cellular stress. It activates the Th2 pathway, the same one as parasites. They test for gestational diabetes one time. So when stress is activated, not only does it cause that stress hyperglycemia, at the same exact time, it causes systemic breakdown of everything in your body because it activates the redox system that causes destruction and repair. And also it can cause gene mutations. So I see all these pieces puzzled on the board. And I'm like, this has to be something. That led me to tyrosine hydroxylase, which took me to BH4 as the common denominator and the chart exploded. That took me to tyrosine hydroxylase, which took me to BH4. I started researching the immune system and the different BH4 dependent pathways. And that took me to the biochemistry of it all. Basically when you're in balance, everything works one way and then cellular stress takes out the linchpin and everything shifts and BH4 is in the center. And that changes which proteins are activated, changing our entire biochemistry, which is why I started calling it neurodivergent biochemistry. The BH4 chart went here, the biochemistry went here, and I really dug deep into the proteins in the middle. I then started digging into the immune system and how that changes things, and our nervous system, and how the brain and body change the way that it communicates with utilizing different neurotransmitters to ensure the resolution of the cellular stress and return to balance. I'm such a nerd. I love this stuff. So I was info dumping online because I saw what I saw in the data. I'm like, ooh, this could really turn into a really big thing. And researchers were getting mad at me because I was creating my own terminology to explain this stuff like neurodivergent biochemistry and the BH4 shunt because that's what's happening in these proteins. And I'm getting all this information from Uniprot, a protein database. I'm not sure if I'm even saying that right because all I've ever done is read these words. I'm an autodidact polymath, so I'm self-taught, but I am a teacher. So I know how to look for um, sources that are credible, which is why I went to a protein database that is well-respected for this data. 
So over this whole time period, I've been refining my hypothesis on the pathology of autism and the comorbidities based on that initial stress hyperglycemia link that I saw and why that happens and what that has to do with BH4, how the allostatic toggles can flip that biochemistry by pulling the linchpin, causing those stress pathways like the stress hyperglycemia to activate, to restore balance, and how that can be caused by either epigenetic or genetic causes, leading to those changes in how the body and brain communicate to resolve the stress and how that shows up systematically when it, it's you live in that state permanently or chronically and how that results in the development of autism and the comorbidities. So basically I've just been info dumping online and making researchers mad and people mad because I'm clumsy in my pronunciations because I'm self-taught and I'm genuinely, I'm just excited about this. This paradigm shift can change for it can help so many people it can create so much change through this process i've been plagiarized i've been on podcasts i've created websites i've written books i've written research gate articles and created paradigm shifting frameworks all from a small town with four thousand people it's been amazing and terrifying and intimidating and exhilarating and so many highs and so many lows and I don't know what the future holds, but I really hope this helps people. So what's the difference between neurotypical and neurodivergent based on everything I've seen in the literature? Neurotypicals live in a chronic or permanent state of balance, and they don't have difficulty restoring balance or very little difficulty restoring balance when that cellular stress triggers allostasis. Autism would be the chronic or permanent state of cellular stress due to gene mutations, leading to these pathways being chronically tilted either way. ADHD would be a struggle to return to a state of balance after cellular stress due to either gene mutations or epigenetics hindering that process of restoration. We'll start with what is cellular stress. Cellular stress is anything that triggers your body into a, basically a turbo state to restore balance. Your body has to work in overdrive to restore that balance when something triggers it. This would be the immune system, metabolites being high or low, physical stress, psychological stress, or genetic mutations. Epigenetics is the proteins that are activated to restore that balance. So that would be the result of the trigger. Now, how does this result in neurodivergence? That's because cellular stress impacts BH4, essentially acting as a linchpin, causing a BH4 shunt that changes the BH4 dependent pathways in a way that changes how the brain and the body simultaneously communicate and resolve said cellular stress. 